that sort of thing. <clears throat> so that's one thing. That's where you can get started. Well, the internet is certainly the key, and and uh, Freedom Watch has become sort of a a a focal point, if you will, of a lot of freedom-loving individuals, many of whom are as youthful as my good friend uh, Shelley here and as youthful as my uh, next guest for exchanging information, political information, economic information, tactical information about who's up, who's down, who needs support, who needs help, and what arguments should be made. Now, talking about who's up and who's down, we may have a real surprise coming in the state of Kentucky. I don't want to jump the gun Dr. Rand Paul, but might you have some kind of an announcement coming about your political future and the future of freedom in the Commonwealth of Kentucky? I do. We've uh, announced that we're forming an exploratory committee to run for the U.S. Senate. Well, congratulations to you, and obviously we wish you well, and it'll be it'll be a great race. Just a little bit of the logistics. Are you are you going to? challenge Senator Bunning in a Republican primary? Are you going to run as a Republican? Are you going to run as a Libertarian? What, what, what are the mechanics for getting out a message of freedom in a, in a system where the two parties seem to control everything? I'm going to be running as a Republican, and it's still uncertain what Bunning, uh, what his plans are. At this point, he says he's running, but he's encouraging other candidates to form exploratory committees that will compete with him for raising money, and he says he will run unless he doesn't raise enough money. So there's a lot of doubt created by encouraging other people to run as to whether or not he'll stay in the race. Some Republicans I meet, even on the executive committee, have been telling me for months that it's a done deal. He's not really running. And if he is running, he needs to overcome that doubt. But because of that, we're organizing. I'm traveling the state. We've got a website, randpaul2010.com and uh, done by some really old political hacks out in California, age 24 and 25. <laughs> Those are the best kind of political hacks to have because, as you may have heard, uh, Shelley Roche and me chatting as we were going through the mechanics of getting you on air with us, the Internet is such a powerful tool, and it is, uh, it is the youth of America that forms the basis uh, for this movement. Uh, Dr. Rand Paul, what is the state of the Republican Party in Kentucky? We know what its state is nationally. It's extremely minority, and to me, it's a numerically minority. I don't think the Republicans even know what they stand for anymore. Well, the interesting thing is, is there's sort of a division in Kentucky the way there is in a lot of states. The leadership of the Republican Party went along with the bank bailout, but if you were to do a poll of the Republican primary electorate, I think you'd find out 80 to 90 percent across the country, and particularly in Kentucky, would have voted no against the bank bailout. So we're sort of at odds with our leaders, which maybe means we need a new set of leaders. You know, as I mentioned to you um, on radio, on Brian and the Judge, earlier today when we talked about this, I was interviewing John McCain the other day, who was trying to sound a little like your father. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Surely you remember September of 08 when you suspended your campaign and flew into Washington supposedly to address the financial mess that the country was in. At that point, 70% of the people were against the bailout. There are a lot of people who think you might be president today if you had voted against the TARP. You went along with it. Well, when the president of the United States says, says there's a problem and he asks you to do it, you got to go along with it. I said, wait a minute. The present president of the United States wants to borrow trillions and you voted against that. Is there any difference between a Republican that wants to borrow trillions and a Democrat that wants to borrow trillions? Yeah, and that's the real problem is that, for example, all throughout the Bush administration, very few of any Republicans voted against the budgets. When the deficit reached $500 billion in a year, you had Ron Paul and about five or six Republicans who would vote against it. Maybe a hand, maybe 20 Republicans, but very few have the guts to vote no. Look at the alternative now. We complain, and all the Republicans voted against Obama, President Obama's $1.75 trillion. But you know what their alternative was? Like four or five hundred billion, and with a plan to balance it in ten years, nobody believes you'll ever balance the budget in ten years if you don't have the guts. You got to stand up the way thirty some odd states do, and you have to balance it every year. And I think one simple way of presenting this to the American public is 
let's just introduce the budget from 2004 and 2010, and, and presto, you've got a balanced budget. Let me ask you about a couple of uh, specifics. I think I have an idea where you stand on them, but I, I want to hear it from you nevertheless. Um, the most offensive parts of the Patriot Act are uh, uh, about to expire. The most offensive part of the Patriot Act, that which allows federal agents to write their own search warrants without having to present probable cause of a crime to a judge will expire at the end of this year. So you, you if, even if you run, wouldn't be in the Congress by then, but it's an issue the Congress will be grappling with. Uh, where do you stand on that? And the issue of closing uh, Guantanamo Bay, where do you stand on that? That, that is closing the, the prison camp for foreign detainees, not the naval base, but the prison camp for foreign detainees at Guantanamo Bay. Where do you stand on that? Well, I'm absolutely opposed to the Patriot Act, would have voted no on it, and would vote to sunset any provisions as quickly as we could. I think one of the greatest descriptions of it is in this little book we read in my book club not too long ago, Constitution in Exile. You heard of that one? I have. You're so kind. <laughs> <laughs> but it is true. You and actually, that the other thing, thing without fucking up too much book? to you that I love, is there's about a four-page summary you have of the destruction of the uh, Fourth Amendment through going from the late 1970s in FISA to the present of what's happened to the Fourth Amendment. When I go to like a gun crowd, what I like to tell them is I'm here to support the Second Amendment, but you know what? You can't have the Second Amendment if you don't have the First Amendment. That's why McCain-Feingold really damages groups like gun groups. And then I say, look, you can't have your Second Amendment if you don't believe in the Fourth Amendment. Right, which, which is why so Thomas You Jefferson. really have to explain this to people, and I think a lot of people understand it, but they don't realize that 99.9% .9 of Republicans all voted for the Patriot Act. Absolutely. And, and, and it's, it's funny how you run through the amendments as you did, Dr. Paul. It's the reason that Thomas Jefferson and the Anti-Federalists said, you want this Constitution you get these ten amendments in there. Uh, Congress, or con I almost called you Congressman because I spent so much time with you, Rand. <laughs> Dr. Rand Paul, thanks for joining us. Thank of course, you, Judge. We wish you the best. We hope you'll come back from time to time and visit with us again at Freedom Watch. I'd love to. And tell your viewers to look at my website, RandPaul2010.com. RandPaul2010.com. Thank you, Dr. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Judge. Pleasure. All right, Glenn Kane Jacobs.